Hello there, my name is Mr. Wizardly. This video is part of a series on my full class rework of the Blood Hunter. You can download my new reworked version of the Blood Hunter class right now, for free, down in the description box below. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this one. Clickety 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 click. If you're interested, you can also watch my full Wizarding Workshop breakdown of my changes to the main Blood Hunter class here, or you can find it by clicking a link in the pinned comment in this video. For those who don't want to watch a half an hour video, there is also a shorter version of that video known as a wizardly clips, which you can watch if you want something with less eccentric waffling that gives a simple overview and cuts straight to explaining the most important changes. So, today we're going to be talking about my rework of the Bloodhunter's Ghost Slayer subclass, which I call the Order of the Ghost Light. One of the reasons why I've given it a different name is because while the flavour is broadly the same, that of a spooky exorcist person, the mechanics have been completely overhauled, to the point where the Ghost Light's features are straight up different from the original, rather than tweaked or rejuggled like I did with the others. That and, well, the Slayer of Ghosts is a bit of a weird thing to call yourself. So, why the radical departure from Matt's original design? The reason is, so many problems are directly built into the structure of the Ghost Slayer. At third level, Matt's default version gave you a special Crimson Rite that dealt Radiant damage, which was the second best damage type in the game. What does this mean? It means that there is almost no reason to use any other damage type for your Crimson Rite, except for a handful of fringe instances where vulnerability to fire damage or the need to stop a creature from regenerating came up. So, against things like Awakened Trees, or Trolls, or Lycanthropes, no no, I wasn't calling you on stage yet, I wasn't talking about Bloodhunter Lycans, I'm talking about the NPC thingamies from the Monster Manual, just, just wait your turn, okay? Now where was I? Hmm... On top of it being a superior damage type, Right of the Dawn also made your weapon into a worse torch. It gave you resistance to necrotic damage, and dealt bonus damage against undead. Now, those benefits are admittedly quite niche, but they're still more useful than ideal fire damage in a generic sense, which just further incentivizes you to use this one damage type and otherwise ignore one of your primary class features. The other Ghost Slayer feature at third level gave you an extra use of Blood Maledict. Which, while it was pretty generic, it at least meant that the feature felt like it actually existed prior to 6th level, and made it so you didn't have to amplify your curses to affect creatures that didn't have blood in them. After that, you could briefly walk through walls for a few turns at 7th level, do more Crimson Rite damage against your brand of castigation target at 11th level, you get a decent blood curse at 15th level, and one of the most thematic features, Right Revival at 17th level, which belatedly helped to compensate for some of the Bloodhunter's innate fragility from amplifying curses and activating Crimson Rites. In a heavily undead-themed campaign like Curse of Strahd, your Rite of the Dawn was just about good enough to make the subclass feel like it could keep its head above of water. Nothing spectacular, but at least it would mostly keep up with everyone else in the party. But in a game where undead were less common, or non-existent, the subclass was easily the worst of the four. You can say what you like about Profane Soul being underwhelming, but at least you can hellish rebuke a fool, which, at lower levels, is almost always better than using an extra blood curse. In my previous videos, I've mentioned how I've given Bloodhunters more blood maledict uses at early levels, so now everyone gets two uses at third level, plus any bonus uses you can squeeze out of killing enemies that have blood in them. So giving them another extra use on top of that is a lot less impactful compared to what it was. And also, I, you know, want to encourage you to not completely ignore all of your other Crimson Rites, or have a feature that needs the campaign to support it in order to function at a reasonable level. So now that we know the problems, what have I done to fix it? Well, clearly this mechanical setup wasn't working, so I looked for a template that could serve as my guide, and my eye was immediately drawn by the strongest subclass Matt's Bloodhunter had, which was the Lycan. Yes, hello again. Thank you. At the core of the Lycan subclass is a powerful combat transformation that lasts for one hour and that comes back on a short or long rest, and many of its other subclass features tie into it. While I do have my own problems with Matt's version of the Lycan subclass, the core design philosophy at play here was solid enough, and it had a good track record with fans. So I cast my mind to what a spooky exorcist person could do to transform, and immediately my eye wandered onto that pathetic excuse for a torch that was written into the Rite of Dawn feature, and thus what I affectionately refer to as the Christmas tree was born. An aura of bright light that burned enemies with radiant damage 
and dealt bonus damage to spiritual entities, the sort that an exorcist might wish to banish. Ghost Slayer was also the subclass most able to engage in dual wielding or using Polearm Master due to its lack of subclass related bonus action uses, so it made it a fairly natural fit to have a power which, like the Lycan, focused on enhancing your close combat abilities. I also liked Matt's idea that the Exorcists were Masters of Curses, so I was quite happy to use that as the starting point for third level feature number two, and as the Christmas Tree was quite a strong ability, it made sense that its counterpart would focus more on giving you small but neat and generally useful effects. To show their mastery over blood curses and emphasize the more scholarly flavor, the Ghostlight can therefore prepare significantly more blood curses than other subclasses, demonstrating their depth of Hemocraft lore and allowing them increased versatility. They also still get the ability to use their curses on creatures without blood in them without needing to amplify the effect, but it also costs them fewer hit points to amplify their blood maledict as well, as they only lose half the number of hit points that other subclasses do, rounding up. Note that I forgot to add the point about rounding up in earlier versions of my PDF. If you have a copy that is pre 2.9.9, then you should probably update it. It's my bad. It was a remnant from a different calculation I was using to determine the number of hit points you lost, which I then predictably forgot to change back after I ditched it, and I only noticed it while making this video. I also realized that the wording was ambiguous over the difference between your blood curses and your special blood maledict uses, so I worded it in such a way that it applied to both. So, whoops, uh, glad that's fixed. You can still do it by rounding down, it's not like it's broken or anything, but it wasn't intended on my part to be quite such a severe reduction of the amplification cost, because I still want it to be something of a choice as to whether you amplify a use of it or not. At 7th level, just like with the Lycan, I wanted to tie some of the features back into the core features of the subclass, namely the Christmas tree. Banish Evil is a fulfillment of the Exorcist's fantasy, as you use your blood magic to banish some extra planar fool back to the hell dimension from whence they came. You spend a number of hit points equal to your character level and target a creature that is illuminated by your Christmas tree with the banishment spell once per long rest, or once every shorter long rest once you reach 18th level. The banishment spell is certainly a very strong 7th level feature, as a 4th level spell slot is usually the equivalent to a full standalone class feature at this level all by itself, but its power level is notably limited by 4 factors. Firstly, because you are not a primary caster, your highest modifier is not going to be your intelligence modifier, so it will likely be slightly less strong in terms of the spell save DC. Secondly, it can only be used in combination with your main subclass feature, which sometimes will be on cooldown. Thirdly, it costs you a sizable chunk of your hit points to use. And fourthly, it has a very limited range compared to the default casting of the spell. Martial classes tend to be a little bit less powerful than full casters anyway, so giving them a slight comparative boost at 7th level isn't really a problem. The other subclass feature at this level is Ghost Walker, which allows you to see into the ethereal plane and helps you to be more aware of your surroundings. In addition, you get a special use of your Blood Maledict, where for one minute you imbue yourself with ghostly essence. This allows you to interact with creatures and objects on the ethereal plane, and you can also use your bonus action to be able to move through creatures and objects as though they were difficult terrain until the end of the current turn. Amplifying it allows you to imbue one of your allies with ghostly essence as well, granting them the same benefits. This is fairly niche but flavorful utility, and you cannot use it to hide inside solid objects anymore, so you have to use it in a more intelligent way to get the most out of it, making use of hollow spaces and thin walls if you want to duck in and out of combat with it like you did before. I've tried my best to standardize the brand subclass feature that everyone gets at 11th level, dealing bonus damage to varieties of creatures that are the Blood Hunter's favored prey. Unsurprisingly, the Ghost Light's favored prey is undead. In addition, the brand also has a subclass specific follow up effect. In this case, you and other creatures of your choosing that are illuminated by your Christmas tree have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, frightened, or possessed by the branded creature. Like a good exorcist, you protect mortals against the danger of otherworldly forces. Because I wanted the 14th level Crimson Rite to be tied to your subclass to make it more unique and flavorful, Rite of the Dawn has been moved into the slot that was previously occupied by what Matt once called your esoteric Rite. It is still in contention for a top two best damage types in the game, and it also grants you immunity to disease while it is active. 
As a side note, DMs, please don't forget that diseases exist, especially when fighting against things like undead or jungle monstrosities or horrific aberrations. There are all sorts of major and minor disease effects that you can homebrew or use from the DMG that you could potentially put your players in danger of contracting once in a while. Paladins, and in this case the Ghost Light, have features that help them with this, so they need to feel like this actually matters occasionally. In a well-designed game, it would, but Wizards of the Coast doesn't really do support for most mechanics, so in the meantime, we plebs are going to have to step up. Hey, hey Wizards of the Coast, I'm still waiting for any kind of guidelines for a crafting system in this game of yours. <sighs> I'm going to have to make it myself, aren't I? Hmm, one day. Anyway, at 15th level, your Christmas tree aura expands to 20 feet, and at 18th level, in addition to the more frequent uses of Banish Evil, you gain the Master of Curses feature. This means that a creature has disadvantage on saving throws against your blood curses while it has half of its hit points remaining or fewer, and is brightly illuminated by your Christmas tree. And when you target a creature that is brightly illuminated with a blood curse, it takes extra radiant damage equal to one roll of your Hemocraft die. If you're wondering where Right Revival went, it is now part of the base Bloodhunter class as a 17th level class feature, as I mentioned in my previous video. So, those are my changes to the subclass. Download the full PDF in the description box below, and let me know what you think about it in the comments section. I'll happily answer any questions you might have. I'm a small enough channel that I can get away with responding to just about everyone. If you like what you see here, don't forget to like and share the video. More videos will be out soon covering my other subclass reworks and more. So hit the bell for notifications, and subscribe to know when those come out. Also, thank you to my paid supporters, Son of Revan and John. My patrons get an exclusive sneak peek of what is coming next, as well as exclusive bonus content, such as a new Bloodhunter subclass that I'm working on. The Order of the Death Knight. It's a totally original concept, do not steal. I don't know what you're talking about when you say that you've seen it somewhere before. You're probably lying or mistaken or something. I totally came up with it all by myself. Also, a full Warlock class rework, including a complete overhaul of nearly every single Eldritch Invocation is coming soon. So that's all from me for now. This is Mr. Wizardly, signing off.